Um, this work that I am going to present was done jointly with Petros Maniatis uh, from Intel Labs Berkeley and Ankit Singla, who, um, who was my intern at EPFL but is now a PhD student at um, UIUC. So let me start by um, describing to you a typical communication scenario in the current internet. We have a source and a destination network, and they are communicating over a couple of internet service providers, or ISPs. At some point, packets start getting lost. The source network calls up their ISP, asks what's going on. The ISP says, I have no idea. My network is fine. Maybe the next ISP is dropping the packets. The next ISP says, my network is fine. Maybe it's the destination who is dropping the packets, and the destination has no idea what these guys are talking about. So the problem I'm trying to solve is that today there is no trustworthy information on the behavior of individual networks when things go wrong in the internet. And here's how I claim that things should be. There should be a way to ask questions like what happened to the packets going from this source to this destination and there should be a way for ISPs to provide verifiable answers. For instance, I introduced this much, this much loss and this much delay into this particular traffic. So there should be a way for ISPs to provide verifiable information on their own behavior. Why would it be a good idea for ISPs to say anything about their behavior at all? Well, one reason is that it may be required by government regulation. There's a lot of debate going on today uh, about whether and to what extent ISP behavior should be regulated. And I think this is the right time for us to discuss how regulators can and should obtain verifiable information on ISP behavior and performance. Moreover, people are already today extracting information on ISP performance. It's just that they're doing it using some ad hoc probing tools, right? Like um, trace route from different vantage points or um, variations of network tomography techniques. As a researcher, I appreciate these techniques. I work on them. But when it comes to deploying them in practice, they can be very inaccurate. And most importantly, there is no way to um, verify the correctness of the results they produce. So if an ISP's performance is going to be assessed anyway, based on potentially inaccurate or untrustworthy methods, the ISP may actually prefer to contribute willingly more accurate and trustworthy performance on uh, information on its own performance. Finally, um, one moment. Uh, finally, the ISPs are already exchanging this kind of information with one another uh, when they're trying to troubleshoot the connections of their customers. It's just that they do it in an ad hoc manual manner. Hence, they would actually benefit from a more systematic way and more trustworthy way to exchange this kind of information. Yes? OK. OK. I'm going to talk about deployment incentives and what makes sense for ISPs to do later. So I will describe Network Confessional, which is a system and protocol um, that does precisely that. It enables ISPs to provide verifiable information on their own performance. At a very high level, here's what happens. The participating domains uh, deploy some new um, functionality at their borders, at their entry and exit points. And I will represent this functionality with these gray boxes here. This new functionality enables each participating domain to produce receipts for the traffic it receives from and delivers to its neighbors. Each receipt is made available to all the domains that observe the corresponding traffic, as well as a regulator. Okay, so if I'm a regulator, for instance, I may collect all the receipts produced by the domains on this path. Whoever collects receipts should be able to process them and compute statistics for the participating domains. That's the high level idea. What are the design goals? First of all, any entity that looks at the receipts produced by a particular domain should be able to compute accurate loss and delay statistics for that domain. Second, they should be able to tell whether the domain is lying, so whether it is faking receipts in order to exaggerate its performance. And finally, producing these receipts should not require maintaining any per packet, per flow, or per path state. This is an important requirement if I want this protocol to be deployable at the Internet core, where we may be seeing you know, tens of millions of packets per second and uh, traffic from hundreds of thousands or even millions of flows and paths at the same time. So we want a protocol that is accurate, lie-resistant, and lightweight. Yes? So I'm just trying to get my head around, is this 
mechanism is going to have any compulsion in it? In other words, I understand how you can detect whether I'm lying, but will the mechanism have any way to force me to actually admit that I saw it happening? So in other words, suppose I just say I never saw anything. The, the sure. guy next to me might say he's supporting it on, mm -hmm. but I can go, well, your link is dropping back in. Mm -hmm. so, Yes, there is something about the mechanism that um, makes you, uh, that not for, it doesn't force you, but it provides an incentive for you to say that you actually observe traffic. So if you pretend that you never received anything, you have to blame it either on a neighbor or an interdomain link. So, you know, it's not my fault, it's the link. And that's fine, but then the problem is that you're advertising to the world that you have this problematic interdomain link that does not work and has all these problems, you can blame it on your neighbor, but the neighbor doesn't like that either because now you're making the neighbor look bad. So, you know, it may break its business agreement with you because you're making it uh, appear to have a very bad link. But we can discuss these incentives extensively later, okay? So the outline for the rest of the talk, I am going to describe how this thing works, how it meets the design goals I set, and discuss some practical issues, including incentives for deployment. I will describe how the protocol works incrementally. So I will start from a very naive, straightforward solution and build on it. For simplicity, I will be using a single path that consists of these four domains. And only for illustration purposes, I will be assuming that each of these boxes ob observes traffic only from this path. Okay, so for the purposes of demonstration, there is no other path in the world right now, just from uh, these particular four domains. So consider the following very simple, straightforward protocol. Each participating domain produces a receipt for every single packet it observes. Okay, so what I'm showing you down here is the code, the functionality that this box executes upon observing a packet P. So it produces a receipt, which says that this particular packet was observed at this particular time by this particular box. Okay, the same thing happens at the exit. Can we use such a very simple mechanism to compute accurate loss and delay statistics, let's say for ISPA? Well, of course we can, right? We can detect whether each particular packet is lost and by how much it is delayed within ISPA. Trivial. Can we detect lies? Without going into details about this right now, yes, we can, because the next domain on the path is also going to produce a receipt for every single packet, which means that ISPA cannot arbitrarily lie about whether and when it delivered a packet to the next ISP, because if it lies, then these two receipts are going to be inconsistent. And I will describe what I mean by receipt inconsistency later, but you get the point. Third question, is this mechanism lightweight? Absolutely not, right? It requires producing a receipt for every single packet you observe, which makes it a very impractical solution, especially for high-speed networks. So what can we do to make it more lightweight? The obvious solution that comes to mind is sampling. We can use sampling in the following way. So every box that observes a packet applies a sampling function and produces receipts only for the sampled packets. Simple. Can we compute accurate statistics using this simple protocol? We can, right? We can compute the loss and delay experienced by the sampled packets, let's say within ISPA, which we can extract from the receipts. And based on that, we can infer loss and delay for the rest of the traffic. This is a very popular and common trick used in network measurement today. But is it lie resistant? So can we make sure, can we detect when domains lie to exaggerate their performance? Consider the following scenario. This box here runs this, this code, so whenever a packet is observed, it applies a sampling function, and if this packet should be sampled, it produces a receipt for it and treats the packet preferentially. So assigns it to a high priority queue or sends it out, uh, down a lightly utilized path. So in this way, each ISP can treat all the sampled packets preferentially and its performance is estimated based on the experiences of the sampled packets, which may have nothing to do with the experiences of the rest of the traffic. Okay? So this simple sampling-based protocol is not, is, is not lie-resistant because in this particular context, biasing is very easy. You can bias the sampling process. So what can we do to make this protocol lie-resistant? 
we can use what I call after the fact sampling. Each box maintains a, uh, a, a buffer of packet metadata. Whenever a packet arrives at the box, the box computes a piece of metadata for that packet and stores it into the metadata buffer. The same thing happens for every observed packet until the metadata buffer is full. At that point, somebody tells this box of these packets that you have, of, this, of all these metadata that you have collected here, I want you to throw away everything but the metadata collected for packets 2, 4, and 5, and I want you to produce receipts for these packets. So in this sense, this box now sampled packets 2, 4, and 5 because it produced receipts only for these packets. But the key point is that each ISP learns whether it has to sample a packet, that is, whether it has to produce a receipt for it, after it has forwarded the corresponding packet, which means that it doesn't have the chance anymore to treat it preferentially. Is that clear? Okay, so the big question um, is who tells each box which packets to sample? Do we have to do that explicitly? The answer is no. Um, this, this signaling happens implicitly in the following manner. So let's say that our box here has observed six packets and collected metadata for them. So what I'm showing here is the metadata, right, not the packets themselves. At some point, a new packet arrives which has some special property. So I will call that a marker packet. The box computes metadata for it, adds it to the buffer. Now this metadata of this special packet is going to determine which of the previously uh, collected metadata uh, the box should keep and produce receipts on. So what I'm essentially doing is that I am keying the sampling function on the contents of future traffic in order to avoid biasing. Let me go one level deep and describe exactly how the sampling algorithm works. A new packet arrives, we compute metadata, add it to the buffer, forward the packet. What is this metadata that I have been talking about? It's a very simple tuple that consists of a timestamp and an identity for the observed packet, for instance, a digest of the packet's headers. Then the box checks whether this particular packet is a marker packet. How? By checking whether a particular property holds, for instance, whether the headers or a part of the content hashes to some value. If this is a marker packet, then the box goes through all the metadata already stored in the metadata buffer and determines which of these packets to, to produce receipts on. An important thing to know is that the criterion which determines which packet is sampled depends both on the idea of the packet itself and the idea of the marker packet. So in this sense, the sampling function is keyed on the contents of future traffic. And then the buffer is emptied. Yes? So that timestamp, is that assigned by this box? Yes. So it seems like I could do this, see what the produced receipts are going to look like. If I don't like these, I twiddle the time a little bit, do the new hash. You can do that. I like play this game so that I, I engineer the receipts I can do. I can do that, but that will cause inconsistencies with my neighbors, and I will get to that later. So you cannot, there is some margin within which I can do exactly what you're saying, but beyond that margin, then there will be an inconsistency, and that will appear to be a lie. So you're assuming a very tight time synchronization? Not tight, within milliseconds. It is within milliseconds, but we'll discuss it again. Sorry, give me the benefit of the doubt sure, sure. Uh, a little bit. Okay. So um, that, that's the, what I described as a sampling algorithm. And um, what, what are the, the parameters of, of uh, the sampling algorithm? Well, first of all, it's this marking threshold mu, which determines which packets are marker packets. And then we have the sampling threshold sigma, which determines uh, which packets to sample. And finally, we have the size of the uh, metadata buffer, beta. These are the three parameters. What is the sampling rate of the algorithm? If we choose uh, this function here to return a random value within some range, and we do the same for this uh, other function, then it is easy to show that the sampling rate, so the probability that each particular, each packet is sampled, is given by this formula. What is important to note is that if we choose beta, that is the size of the metadata buffer, to be large enough, then 
this part of the formula becomes insignificant. And again, I will talk about specific values later. But the point is that we can, I'm essentially doing a very simple sampling uh, algorithm here, uh, where the sampling rate is determined by this one uh, parameter sigma. Okay. The way I have described things so far, uh, it's as if each box ob observes traffic from a single path. That's what I said in the beginning. However, in reality, the world looks more like this. So we have multiple intertwined paths. And when I say a path, in this context, I mean a sequence of particular domains. So what happens when each box observes traffic from a million paths at the same time? Logically, each box runs the same algorithm I already described to you uh, separately for each different path. How? The new packet arrives, we compute metadata for it, and we add it to the buffer. It's just that the metadata consists not only of a timestamp and an ID, but also the path of the packet. And again, give me the benefit of the doubt. Let's assume that we know which is the path followed by the packet at this moment. We check whether the packet is a marker. And if so, we go through all the uh, metadata stored in the buffer. We check which of this metadata corresponds to packets from the same path with a marker. and um, we check which of these packets to sample, okay? And we produce receipts for them. Then we delete all the metadata that, again, corresponds to this path. So this is exactly the algorithm I said before, with the only difference that I am uh, multiplexing metadata from multiple paths using a single buffer. So what is the sampling rate now? Uh, does it change things that I have multiple paths in there? So. If I do as before, and I choose my uh, hash functions appropriately, then it is easy to show that this is the sampling rate of the algorithm, where alpha now is the, um, is the rate uh, of, is the percentage of the corresponding link um, that is consumed by traffic from the specific path. So let me um, repeat this. If we have a particular path that consumes alpha percent of all the traffic on this link, then this is the probability that each packet from that path is sampled. Okay? And the important thing to note is that if we choose the metadata uh, uh, buffer size beta carefully, then this portion becomes, again, insignificant. And the only thing that matters is the sampling threshold sigma. So which, pack, which path a packet belongs to does not affect the sampling rate. What are the resource knobs of the algorithm? So how can a box determine how many resources to devote to the sampling process? Um, first of all, the marking threshold, mu, is a global variable. So it's the same for all boxes on the path. However, both the sampling threshold and the uh, metadata uh, buffer uh, size are locally, uh, are variables that can be chosen independently by each box. Okay, so each node controls the amount of resources it spends without doing any coordination with uh, other boxes on the path. What happens when we have domains uh, that use the same amount of resources? Uh, this means that they use the same parameters. If there is no reordering uh, on the path between these two boxes, then, of course, they use the same algorithm, the same parameters. Obviously, they're going to sample the same packets. That is easy to see. What happens when we have domains with different amounts of resources, which means that they use different parameters? So let's say that ISPB here, and this, the, the entry box of ISPB, uses a smaller uh, metadata buffer and a smaller sampling threshold than ISPA. Of course, it is going to sample fewer packets. But the important thing is that these packets will necessarily be a subset of the packets that will be sampled by ISPA because of the way the algorithm works. So as long as there is no reordering between the two domains, domains sample non-partially overlapping packet sets, which maximizes the number of packets that are commonly sampled by different domains. And this is important for the accuracy of the statistics, as I will discuss later. So let me recap um, how network confessional works. Um, each participating domain produces receipts um, for sampled packets, and we use sampling to avoid maintaining per packet state. Um, Sampling, the sampling function is keyed on the contents of future traffic, and we do that to avoid biasing. Um, and domain sample non-partially overlapping packet sets, which maximizes the number of packets that are commonly sampled by domains that use different parameters because they have different resources. So any questions so far? Yes? 
Sorry, so the metadata to the packet contains the timestamp only for the marker or the timestamp for everything? For the packet only. For the marker packet or for each packet? For each. So you have one piece of metadata for each packet. Right. That has the timestamp when the packet itself was observed, not the marker. Right, okay, so I guess my question is it's not clear to me then why the same packet would get sampled at both routers if the metadata at each router is dependent on a local timestamp. Oh, 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 no, I'm sorry. So the, the sampling function does not take into account the timestamp. It only takes the ID into account. I see. So it's the marker that takes the time. In that sense, yes, yes, I'm sorry, I didn't understand your question, yes. <coughs> okay, so um, let me describe how uh, Network Confessional meets the three design goals that I said. Law statistics, so let's say that ISPA received seven packets from the source domain, lost two, so it lost packets one and four and delivered the rest to ISPB. So this is the state of the metadata buffer at the entry and the exit of the ISP after all these packets have been forwarded. So the box at the entry of the ISP runs the protocol, I the, the algorithm I described, and chooses to sample these three packets. The same thing happens at the exit, with the difference that packet four was lost, so we don't sample it. Okay, so now I am a uh, regulator. I have collected the receipts produced by ISPA. How can I compute law statistics for it? Oh, it's trivial, right? I count how many packets were sampled here, how many packets were sampled there, and I divide the two. That's very easy to do. Does reordering mess things up? Does it affect the way I compute the loss of the domain? So suppose that because of packet reordering, these packets 5 and 8 here were swapped with their marker at the exit uh, of the ISP, of ISPA. So as before, the, the entry box chooses to sample packets 2, 4, and 5, and whether packet 8 is sampled will depend on another marker that will come later. Okay, so let's say that it is not sampled. At the exit box of the same ISP, again, we, we run the sampling algorithm, and we choose to sample packets 2 and 8, and packet 5 now, which was observed after the marker, whether this will be sampled or not, is determined by the next marker, and let's say that it is not sampled. So, the important thing to note is that packet 5, which should have been sampled at the exit, was not because of reordering, but packet 8, which should not have been sampled, now was because of reordering. So, in this way, I can cancel out statistically packets that I lose and packets that I gain due to reordering, and I can still trivially compute the loss in this manner. Why am I telling you this sort of obvious thing? Because it's important to note that um, reordering does have an impact, not on the way I compute, I estimate loss, but on the accuracy of the estimate. I will not go into details, and it's actually not difficult to compute. This is the relative standard deviation of my loss estimate. Okay? So, this says that I have ISPA, it introduces this amount of packet loss, the probability of each packet being lost, and this is the probability of a packet being reordered with its marker. Okay? Then this is the relative standard deviation of the loss estimate I'm going to compute with my algorithm. So reordering here does, does play a role. Okay? It means that I need to sample for a longer period of time in order to achieve the same relative standard deviation. So reordering does not change the way we do statistics, but we, it requires a higher sampling rate in order to achieve a given accuracy. Delay statistics, it turns out that they're much easier to compute. Okay, all I need to do is detect which packets are commonly sampled at the entry and the exit, compute delay statistics for the sampled packets, estimate statistics for the rest, and I can do that using existing techniques like the one proposed by Somers et al. in 2007. Let me talk about lie detection. So, again, this simple scenario where ISPA has observed these seven packets at the entry and has lost two. So, if it runs the, my algorithm honestly, at the entry it's going to produce receipts for packets two, four, and five, and at the exit only for packets two and five. Now let's say that it decides to lie. Okay, so it reports that it actually delivered packet four to the next ISP. If ISPB is also running my algorithm with the same parameters, then it is going to produce receipts only on packets two and five. 
that right there is an inconsistency, right? It says ISP A says I delivered packet 4, ISP B says I never got ISP uh, packet 4. So there's two kinds of inconsistencies. One is what I just described, packet delivered but not received, and the other one has to do with timestamp difference. So normally we expect the difference in timestamps reported for the same packet by these two neighboring boxes to be within a threshold. Who chooses that threshold? The ISPs themselves. So they advertise it. They say, you know, this is the latency of my interdomain link. They're free to choose a very big latency that gives them margin for lying, but then they're, they're appearing to be bad, right? Because they're advertising that the connection between them introduces a lot of latency into their traffic. So lies are detected through receipt inconsistencies. And an important thing to, to clarify is that if I, as a regulator, collect these receipts and they're inconsistent, um, I don't know which of the two ISPs is lying, but I inform the two ISPs of the inconsistency. This means that if ISP A lies and tries to blame its problems on ISP B, ISP B will know. Okay, so given the way ISPs work today, I really doubt that one ISP would lie if that would expose them to their peer and business partner as uh, a cheat. You know, they, they would be exposed as trying to blame their problems on the neighbor. Okay, is that clear? So another point to clarify about lie detection is what happens when domains use different amounts of resources. So let's say that ISP B is a poor ISP, so it uses a lower sampling threshold, and it samples only packet 5 here. This means that ISP A is free to say whatever it wants about packets 2 and 4. Okay, because ISP B is not going to sample these packets anyway, so we don't know what's going to happen to them. So of course, lies can be detected only for commonly sampled packets. And taking this to the extreme, if ISP B does not deploy the protocol at all, then ISP A can lie about all the packets and blame all its problems on ISP B. You can view it as a bug or as an incentive for actually deploying this protocol. And let me uh, talk a little bit about the third design goal, which was that we would not maintain any expensive state. So this is the algorithm that I showed you before, and that is executed by this box whenever it observes a new packet. And of all these algorithms, the only lines that produce state are these three lines. So whenever a packet arrives, we compute the tuple and we add it to the metadata buffer, and occasionally we sample a packet. So we maintain two kinds of state. It's the metadata buffer, and, of course, the produced receipts. So the important thing to note, again, is that even though each box may be observing traffic from millions of paths at the same time, it does not maintain any per path or per flow state. Okay, it just needs a fixed length metadata buffer. So let me recap what were the design goals that I set. I said that I wanted somebody who collects the receipts from produced by an ISP to be able to compute accurate statistics about it, and I can do that based on sampled packets. I said that I wanted to be able to tell whether an ISP is lying and producing fake receipts to exaggerate its performance, and that is made possible because of after the fact implicit sampling. And I said that producing receipts should not require maintaining any per packet, per flow, or per path state, and indeed, Network confessional requires only a fixed length metadata buffer and enough resources to store the produced receipts. So before concluding, I will briefly discuss some practical issues, uh, starting with clock synchronization. Um, so Alex asked about this earlier, and I, I said that delay statistics and lie detection uh, is based on comparing receipts produced for the same packet at different boxes. This implies clock synchronization. So do I require that every single box in the internet that would deploy this thing would have synchronized clocks? The answer is no. However, given that each domain's delay performance is estimated based on the timestamps it reports, it is in the domain's best interest to keep its clocks roughly synchronized within milliseconds. Okay? Otherwise, it's performance may be um, underestimated. Similarly, lie detection happens based on the timestamps reported by two neighboring boxes of neighboring ISPs. So it is in their best interest to keep their boxes, clocks, uh, reasonably synchronized in order to avoid uh, creating um, receipt inconsistencies and appearing as if they're lying. 
So clock synchronization is not imposed in any way by the protocol, but it would be a good idea to keep close, uh, clock synchronized within a few milliseconds. Another issue which may be in the back of your mind is path classification. I said that upon observing a packet, we compute a tuple that includes the path where this packet belongs. This cannot be done in practice. However, what I can do is approximate the path as the source destination prefix pair. The important property that needs to hold in order for my algorithm to work is that every box that observes the same packet computes the same path for that packet. And that can be met if we use this, um, this very practical and simple approach. Okay. Let's say I am an ISP and I want to deploy this protocol. What is the cost of adding the corresponding functionality to my network equipment? First of all, I need, so I said that the network confessional requires two kinds of resources. We have the fixed length metadata buffer and we have the receipts. So let's start with the metadata buffer. How large should it be? Remember that I introduced the, the metadata buffer in the first place in order to perform after the fact sampling. So the idea was to prevent an ISP from treating samples preferentially. However, a smart ISP could engage in the following behavior. Um, buffer all the observed packets, right? Um, wait until they receive the next marker packet, know which packets they would need to sample, and then drop the rest and treat the sample packets preferentially. Right? So I should be able to, to prevent this behavior. And the way to do that is, one way to do that is to choose the size of the metadata buffer carefully. So it should be um, small enough such that, it should be large enough such that, and, uh, such that the um, maintaining the metadata buffer itself is cheap, but maintaining the big, uh, a big buffer that, where you would store all the corresponding packets is expensive. So it should be chosen such that cheating in this manner is forbiddingly expensive. Without going into details about this, uh, given um, the uh, memory prices today and the, the typical uh, packet sizes, a reasonable value for the, the metadata uh, buffer size would be 100,000 tuples. And um, that can be implemented today using a 2 megabyte uh, ternary content addressable memory chip, which is readily available hardware. Yes? No. Uh, why, why, what do you have in mind? It seems like you want to have overlapping packets going down the path, and the probability is going to be increasing over time, over each hop, and then you'll have overlapping packets. Right. So you, I, I think I understand what you're trying to say, but the way I do this is not by necessarily by, keep, by increasing the, the size of the metadata buffer, but choosing the right relationship between that size and the frequency with which I choose markers, right? Okay. So, uh, sorry, um, what is the cost of producing receipts? Uh, it depends on how frequently we produce them, and that in turn depends on the accuracy of the statistics that we want to, uh, to obtain. I showed you earlier this formula. Again, the exact uh, thing doesn't matter, but the point is that I can plug in numbers here. I can say that I want to be able to estimate loss, let's say, of 10% with a particular relative standard deviation, assuming a certain amount of reordering, and then I need a certain number of samples. Okay, And then I can compute how frequently I should sample. So to give you a sense, without tiring you with too many numbers, if we have, if an ISP is introducing 5% loss and we want to estimate that with a relative standard deviation of 10%, then we need about 2,000 samples. Giving, plugging in some typical numbers, this means sampling about 0.1% of traffic. And if we add a little bit of reordering, then we need to sample about 0.5% of traffic. And by the way, I'm being very conservative here. 10% probability of a packet being reordered with its marker is very big today given the, the kind of reordering we observe. So what is the point? That if we want to deploy a network confessional, we need some readily available hardware, and we need the capability to sample at rates below 1%, which routers can already do today. It's not that big a deal. Before concluding, um, let me talk a little bit about incentives for deployment. Why would ISPA spend the resources to deploy this kind of thing? Well, as I said in the beginning, it may be required. 
it may be that ISPA's performance is already estimated through your, you know, glasnost or your latest um, academically generated uh, way of, of estimating the performance of an ISP. Um, and by, by deploying a network confessional, it actually prevents um, its neighbors from leaving their problems on it. The converse is also true. If an ISP does not deploy what I described and its neighbors have, then of course they can blame all their problems on that ISP. So in this sense, the more you tell about your performance, the safer you are from lies told by others. What if ISP A is the only ISP on this path that has deployed this protocol? Is there any benefit for it? There is one, which is that when things go wrong, this ISP is the good guy. I mean, it's still producing information about what happened to the traffic, and it's not its fault that the other ISPs are not up to the task. So an ISP may use this as an incentive for its customers to connect all their uh, networks through it, since it is the only ISP providing useful information. So I will conclude so that we can discuss. Network confessional is essentially an interface through which ISPs expose accurate information on their performance. Um, I rely on after the fact implicit sampling to prevent ISPs from biasing the sampling process and exaggerating their performance. And it requires only readily available hardware and capabilities that already exist in uh, modern networks. So it is an alternative to ad hoc probing ways of estimating ISP performance that provides trustworthy information on network behavior. That's it. Questions? Yes. So it seems like something like this, that ISPs must do something like this already. As far as... An individual ISP must have some ah. idea of the traffic that's coming in, the traffic that's going on. I mean, they run a business, so... Sure. You know, what's the percentage of the packets I'm delivering, right? And so, so, in, so what do they do right now? So, because I sort of see a couple different things. I mean, there's, there's, there's the one sort of contribution, which is sort of the high-level contribution. There's this big system. People are going to get all excited about those incentives. And then there's the other sort of, well, we came up with some interesting techniques for doing sort of randomized sampling that has nice properties that can tell you that, you know, if you get some amount of reordering, we know how to increase the amount of sampling and ensure that we get some good statistics. So I'm trying to sort of figure out, it, it seems like those might be applicable whether or not they buy into the whole story, right? So the technique, first of all, what different ISPs do different things as far as I know. In Switzerland, they're far behind, I think, the American ISP, so they have very um, bad and low quality ways of measuring what's happening to their traffic. But I think that American ISPs do things, for instance, they rely on NetFlow to observe what's going on in their traffic. They may do some form of sampling, um, sampled NetFlow, I guess, in order to, to see you know, how much loss, how much delay they have. They do this kind of thing. I think they also use probing tools. Um, the additional problem I was trying to solve is that I wanted to prevent them from lying. So if you trust an ISP to tell you the truth, then you don't need anything from what I have described because it can just do sampling. If, however, you want to test the truthfulness of what they're saying, then you need to prevent them from biasing and then you need my techniques. Okay? So that is the thing I added. So it's very close to what ISPs are doing, and that's on purpose. I tried to see what, what are they practicing anyway, right? And I wanted to add something small and simple that would make these techniques usable also by a regulator who wants to make sure that an ISP is not lying. Th does that answer the question? No? Yes? So what happens for a given ISP? Every time a regulator comes around and wants to measure the performance of an ISP, they get great results. Mm -hmm. But other users complain. Mm -hmm. The ISP says, well, those users are lying. Mm -hmm. You can measure me, and you can measure the show that actually I have great results. So, are you assuming that the ISP is lying at all or not? Is it doing it on purpose that the receipts given to the regulator are good, but the receipts given to the end users are bad? Okay. So, I assumed here that there is one set of receipts that are, let's say, signed. I mean, in some lightweight manner. I, I won't get into what's the right way to do that, but there is a way to verify that there is one set of receipts for each packet. 
So an ISP, there, there must be a way for an ISP to not be able to give one receipt about the same packet to the regulator and another to the user. Okay? So if users get bad receipts, right, they can just send them to the regulator and say, look, here are the receipts that this ISP gave, and immediately it will become obvious whether the ISP played this trick. Right? Uh, now, it's possible that a regulator does not collect receipts all the time. Right? It comes you know, once a month, and then suddenly the, um, the ISP start behaving well. Well, the point is that the other users have collected receipts in the meantime and can give them to the regulator, and based on these, the regulator can, can judge um, what was the performance of the ISP, as long as there, there is, it can authenticate right, the, the receipts. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Come on, there, there must be objections, uh, yes. I'm trying to get my head around the delay bound. So mm -hmm. it seems like the delay is going to come due to congestion. Right? So I have a fixed propagation delay on my link, and that we can all measure and agree on. So and the real delay is going to come due to queuing. And so the question is, do I timestamp when it enters the queue or when I exit the queue? Mm -hmm. So it looks good for me if I timestamp when I enter. Mm -hmm. But if I timestamp when I enter, then I have to be willing to withstand the entire queue length in the worst possible case mm -hmm. as our budget delta for cheating. Mm -hmm. Because I don't want to be accused of cheating when in fact there was just congestion. Mm -hmm. right, so what that means is I need a big D between me and my neighbor to handle any potential congestion on that. But the bigger the D I get, the more there's for cheating. So when there's congestion, then he takes the opportunity to back that D out and moves. And so it seems like I can play this game of when things aren't congested, I timestamp as it's going out of my queue, and I make you look bad because you know it's coming right at you. Mm -hmm. And when things get ugly for me, I timestamp when it's coming into my queue. And now there's nothing you can do, and you have this huge. Okay. So. And, and so that seems like that's going to dominate the propagation delay, unless I have a satellite link or something. So it depends on how I, I implement things. So you're right that the very important point is where do I timestamp? So the way I've been thinking about it, I um, the this kind of delay. You're, you're, if at the end of the interdomain link there is a queue, right? Um, I don't think there is a way of actually timestamping the packet that the moment it enters the queue. I mean, implementation-wise in a router, that would be very difficult. I mean, so, there, so I guess what I'm thinking of is at the beginning, so I'm an edge router, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking, and I don't know how this aligns with router design now, but I'm thinking there are two line cards, mm -hmm. and I can either timestamp it on the in, input port, or I can timestamp it as it goes out the output port. Right. So, so, so this is basically before it experiences any queuing or after it's seen all the queuing. Right. So one, one way to address what you're saying would be to timestamp it at the exit port, and then the delay of this queue right. is charged to the interdomain link if it happens, if there is delay, if there's congestion. The queue be on the router. So in other words, if this is my peering router, so the queue is going to be at the router trying to leave the, the link. So right. I don't want to get charged for this delay. So I want to get, I'll, I'll time it at the moment it comes in. So, okay. That's is not necessarily an option, right? So, sure, it might make the ISP look better, but the issue is how the protocol works. So I have the delay that is happens because on the interdomain link, the delay that the delay you're talking about is charged to the interdomain link. That's what happens. So it's not true that when I when the, the timestamp difference exceeds the threshold, then that means lying. It can mean either lying or, or problems on the interdomain link. Okay? So that's the way I address this. Um, if you have a lot of delay, then this is going to appear on the interdomain link, and now you're also harming your peering ISP because both of you are considered guilty when the interdomain link appears to be bad. And in some sense, that's an incentive for ISPs to pick good peers. Okay? So I timestamp at the exit of the router. I don't timestamp at the entry. Does, does that make sense? No, that I confused you. I have no way as a peer to ensure that that's what you're doing to me. And it's in both of 
our interest to make sure that this link doesn't constantly show up as, as, as violating the delay. In, in the end, it all, it all adds up. So it's a trade-off. What delay you advertise, right, and how often it looks like you're lying on your ha or you're having problems on your interdomain link. So if the two ISPs want to lie, that's fine by me. So they lie to me about where they timestamp and they advertise this huge delay, huge, this very big delay on their interdomain link in order to, you know, blame uh, and they tell their customers that is because there could be congestion. So fine, but then they're admitting that there could be congestion and then it will look very frequently like they have a problem. So it all adds up in the end because I look at these differences across the path. That you, you, you see what I'm saying? Yeah, so I guess, and this is just because I'm ignorant, I have no idea what, what's a reasonable buffer in practice. In other words, most of these links presumably have nanoseconds, you know, things mm -hmm. are well, and then when things are bad, is it seconds, milliseconds? Like, I have no so, idea how bad it gets. All right, it depends on the router. Um, so my sense, the last time I checked, was that when we're talking about the core, um, we have very big buffers, you know, multi tens of megabytes, you know, I've even heard of, of gigabyte buffers. So there can be a lot, th there can be a large latency there. Um, if we're talking more towards the, the edge, we have smaller buffers, hence smaller corresponding red latency. So, so it, all, it all depends. Okay. Yes. So my understanding is that the metadata is much smaller. The, I'm sorry, the what? The metadata? Yes. And so, I mean, what if I just drop all the packets and the world metadata? Um, so. I just want to draw packets mm -hmm. and just send the metadata. So I don't send, so the metadata is kept locally. Yeah. So what I do as, as an ISP is that I collect metadata and I forward the packets, and based on the metadata, I compute receipts. So there, there is no point, uh, there, there is no point, the metadata is not meant to be sent anyway. So if I drop all my packets, there's two things I can do. Uh, I just send metadata in such a way that the exit route. Ah, you, I'm, I'm lying. I, I see what you're saying. So I'm being smart and I'm, I'm dropping the packets and I'm sending the metadata so that it produces fake receipts. Mm -hmm. If it does that, there's going to be an inconsistency with the next box. So what will end up happening is that I will claim I delivered the packets, even though I didn't because I dropped them at the entry. But the next ISP is going to say, I never received these packets. So right there, there will be an inconsistency. And nobody knows who's lying. Nobody knows who's lying, but the guy I'm blaming knows it. And the mechanism is such that when I lie, I am blaming my partner. So there's no way for both to say, we don't know. It's like there's a system in place and they have to say what happened, right? Yes? Um, this is slightly tangential. Um, supposing that all of these statistics existed uh, and we've got a large topology that we're trying to understand, uh, have you given any thought or have you seen any instances of visualizations that render the uh, situation with delays to somebody who's trying to troubleshoot a network? No, so I, I am not aware. And I'm not, I am aware of what our ISPs do in Switzerland, and they don't, don't have any interesting visualization tools. I'm not sure about the latest that's being used here. As far as I know, visualization tools are somewhat simple today. So they may show you what links that go red you know, because there's a lot of traffic or there is packet loss. They may show you, you know, some diagram where there is fat, red traffic, you know, that show, shows you the utilization that goes up. But I don't think that there are visualization tools for, for instance, detecting, you know, lies, inconsistencies, this kind of behavior. But it would be not easy, but um, it, it, it's, it's uh, feasible to, to look at this information and, and compute visually meaningful data, right? You know where the beginning point is, you know where the ending point is, and your objective is to drill down and see where the problem might be. Right. So my question about these receipts is that given that they're not tied to every single packet uh, and that they're essentially statistically sampled, is it possible then to actually 
Well, it is because the receipts are tied to individual packets, and that is one of the points of the whole approach. So even though I am computing statistic, I am computing loss and accuracy statistically, right? The receipts correspond to particular packets, and different ISPs sample the same packets. They choose the same samples, right? So if there is a lie, it's going to be about a particular packet, and I will know exactly where that lie happened. That's the whole point of doing the sampling in this manner. Okay. So if I have a 10-hop route and uh -huh. I put packet A on, on the network uh, at the beginning, I can see what its latency was at each hop uh, until it gets to hop 10. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Each of the sampled packets. For the rest, I cannot, of course, right? Mm -hmm. That's, so I think you're, you're, what you're saying is, um, is very important, that there are techniques that try to sample, and each node samples randomly its own sets of packets, and then you cannot do exactly what you're saying. This is why it's important to sample in a consistent manner, yet not, not enable biasing. That's the whole effort. Everybody's convinced that this is the right thing to do. Why would an ISP lie? Well, it's it has happened in the past that when you know Keynote or or other uh, companies use some measurement tool to estimate ISP performance and publish it, the ISP treats the probes preferentially to appear better because marketing matters to them, right? So they don't want there to be a website that says, "Here is my you know tracer based measurements of the day about all the ISPs." They don't want to to appear at the bottom. So they would lie, they would treat the sample packets preferentially just because it would make them look better. Um. Um, no, not at all, I cannot. Oh, so I, I failed to explain that. So um, marker packets, you mean the marker packets that I can treat them preferentially? Okay, so marker packets are not used to infer performance. They're only used to determine which of the previously forwarded packets to sample. Okay, so I am an ISP, I observe packets, I have to forward them, I can't keep them, right? They go. So I guess part of what I'm wondering about is as in, who controls the implementation of the system? The ISP can do whatever it wants. So why can't I have multiple buffers and I can preferentially assign traffic to individual buffers? I can do that, but I do not know in advance which packets I will have to report on. Right, but I will, I will still put all of Keynote's packets into a special Keynote buffer and everybody else. Sure. Oh, well, I, I got what you're saying. So it's true. If I do, I can do that with Keynote. So if there is, I'm sorry, if there is a particular company, I used a bad example before. So if there's a particular application that I want to treat preferentially, I can absolutely do the same trick. But what I'm suggesting is that, um, the performance of an ISP is estimated based on all, you know, a variation of uh, a, a variety of packets, right? So the regulator would not look only at packets um, from Keynote. It would look at traffic from a source to destination, you know, coming from a variety of of, uh, of flows, right? So it's going to choose a random set of source to destination. So ideally, it should look at all the sampled packets. Okay, all the sampled packets. And each ISP, from each path, where a path is a source destination network pair, is going to sample a bunch of packets from that path, that, and it does not choose which ones, right? So it has to sample, let's say, a million packets during this minute from this path, report them to the regulator. Th there's nothing it can do. I mean, how? So, I mean, my sense is that uh, my ISP isn't the greatest, and they they don't even try to advertise themselves as the greatest in terms of what okay. they brought. Mm -hmm. like so I'm trying to get a sense for who is who cares for this kind of information, yeah. or so that's you know an interesting discussion, right? I I can't prove to you 
that ISPs would do it, you know, they would benefit economically for having this kind of thing. Um, if an ISP doesn't care for its reputation because it sells itself as an okay ISP, there's no reason for any of this. Uh, this is meaningful only in scenarios where there's competition, where there is a lot of ISPs and they want to appear to be good. If the government says you're not supposed to treat, you know, peer-to-peer -peer traffic, let's say, worse than other kind of traffic, and an ISP comes as well, I'm not doing it, I'm a good ISP, um, you can connect through me, then this kind of mechanism has a point, right? And then good ISPs can use it to say, look, I'm, I'm behaving, I'm being good. Maybe a regulator will impose it on all ISPs. So from the moment you have regulation, you need something. You need something like this. Otherwise, you'll never be able to check whether uh, ISPs are behaving the way they should, right? Whether ISPs will do it on their own without uh, it being imposed, that I don't know. It really depends on the competition and the setting. You can, you can always localize any lie to a pair, whether there is collusion or not. Okay. Well, okay, no, but to a pair is, I mean, then it's, then it's just one word against the other. Oh, absolutely. So, the, as, as I said before, a third party, like a regulator, will never know which of the two ISPs is telling the truth. It's what you said. The point is that the ISP who's being lied, lied against will know. And will know that the neighbor is blaming its problems on that ISP. So then it might break, for instance, the business agreement with a neighbor. Okay, so it, it, it's the, the, the mechanism provides a way for the neighbor to know that his neighbor is lying. And, and blaming its problems on it, yes. So that, that's an important part. Right? The way, because of the way the mechanism works, there's only one way of lying, to blame your problems on others. You will either claim that you didn't drop, that the next guy dropped them, right, or the next guy delayed them. So I am providing a way from the cheated neighbor to detect that. So I guess the, the larger question is, right now all the major players don't say anything about each other. Mm -hmm. This provides a mechanism for all of them to say everybody else is lying about me. Mm -hmm. Fred says, oh, AT&T's full of crap, Quest is full of crap. You, they, no, no, I'm good. They're all lying about me. Mm -hmm. And they, they all do that reciprocally. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And we get nowhere. In other words, it, sure. it, 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 it seems like as long as they all collude to agree to complain about each other, yes. we have yes. mechanisms to agree. Sure. So that's... You get into another interesting point, which is the economics of this whole system. And you can even do a sort of game theoretical analysis, although I'm, I'm not into that kind of thing. But um, sure, one possible scenario is that all the ISP says, we're not going to do this, period. You know? Or then the government comes and says, oh, you have to do it. And then they all keep lying. You know? Then you get nowhere. Sure, that, that's one possible scenario. Another one is that there is competition, and the new ISP sees an opportunity and says, okay, all these guys are you know, not making any sense. Here, I'm the nice guy, I'm going to come in and I'm going to tell you exactly what's going on and I'm going to be honest. So how it plays out depends on whether there is you know, an equilibrium where somebody can make profit out of this. It's not clear which, which way things will go. And I think it depends on a lot of things. For instance, what internet users expect. If they don't mind you know, their ISP is not behaving very well every now and then, okay. But if they become more demanding and they expect a certain kind of behavior, then maybe they're willing to prefer ISPs who honor, you know, this kind of protocol. It, it seems they're already doing this, right? I mean, they're already blaming each other. That's not right, they're... And, and and so that, that seems to be working just fine for them. They're not, they're not, like, not talking to each other anymore. So they're... 
Yes, so it's working just fine because they don't have to blame one another explicitly and that is very important. So it's one thing if AT&T says, you know, you know I'm fine, um, it's not me who's dropping your packets, probably it's Sprint, but you, re you know, I don't know, maybe it's also the destination. And Sprint says the same thing and they don't have to be bad with one another and say, here's proof, here's a receipt that ISP dropped the packet. They don't have to do that kind of thing. And I'm arguing that if you put a system in place that makes them explicitly lie, then it will be different. Then they're not going to do it. Because then, you know, it can even be sued, right, by the other ISP. I'm sorry, so I missed the last part of your question. You said that it would be possible or it would not be possible. It would be possible to detect either a country or a market Yes. Yes, so I think it is. It depends on how many points of trust I have in the network. So if I trust, you know, the last hop, let's say there, there are particular nodes that belong to particular countries that I trust, then based on what they report, if I take it as truth, I can detect attacks in the middle, yes, like the ones you described. <laughs>